Stalker. S-T-L-K-E-R. <sighs> Where to begin? I suppose the intro cutscene would be a good place to start. This is a death truck. We never learn who this man is, just some guy, a stalker. The body he's carrying is us, the player character, marked one, because we have the stalker mark. What's the Strelok? For this one, I can give you. Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl is a 2007 first person shooter developed by Ukrainian video game company GSC Game World. The company was founded in 1995 by then a 16 year old entrepreneur Sergei Grigorovich, who at the time made a living selling counterfeit video games at a flea market. By 1996, Grigorovich employed several people in a two room apartment, and in 98, they were done working on their first video game project. Project, Warcraft 2000 Nuclear Epidemic, an illegal Ukrainian sequel to a popular real-time strategy game by Blizzard. What the Christ! The idea was to show a prototype to whoever was in charge of Blizzard in order to win a contract for the development of Warcraft 3. This was an absolutely insane plan that did of course fail. I don't think there was ever such a contest. Grigorovich would later say that the reason they haven't received the contract was because of distrust of Eastern European developers. Well, maybe, but I'm sure the fact that at the time Grigorovich was still technically a minor didn't exactly help his credibility. Putting their Warcraft 2000 technology to good use, in April 2001, GSC released Cossacks European Wars, a real-time strategy game in a historical setting. Cossacks was very well received, allowing Grigorovich and crew to begin work on a new project, an Aztec-themed first-person shooter in a science fiction universe similar to Stargate. A year later, the project was renamed and its concept completely changed. One of the artists came up with an idea to create a first-person adventure about collecting artifacts that would be based on a Soviet science fiction story. In spring 2002, the development team visits the Zone of Alienation near Chernobyl. The experience inspires them. From now on, they're developing Stalker. So, Mark One, I saved you, and I'm not going to pretend I did it to win favors upstairs. The adventure begins. Sidorovich, the trader, sends us off on a tutorial mission. Good hunting, stalker. I'm not sure how noticeable this is on YouTube, but Shadow of Chernobyl has very over-exaggerated head bobbing. This can be fixed by mods or via console, but for the purposes of this playthrough, I want to experience Stalker in its most authentic form possible. This is the Rookie Village, which is the closest thing the place has to an official name. When the disaster struck, the village was evacuated, the homes abandoned, the possessions left behind plundered. Eventually, a trader moved in, making deals with whoever, stalkers, soldiers, Zone's ideologues. Sidorovich is apolitical. Don't say that he's hypocritical. Say rather that he's apolitical. The Rookie Village is where amateur explorers learn the ropes. This is where stalker careers begin. And just as often, it's the place where they end. Wolf here is the leader and mentor of the local community. He provides us with a starter pistol and introduces one of the zone's many hazards. Armed bandits. Guys, I'm sending someone your way, so wing it. You may attack if necessary. Over. Alright, Wolf, send him in. As long as he stays out of the way, out. Wolf doesn't have enough men to take them out. This is where we come in. But before we go, we partake in Eastern Slav social rituals. The Makarov pistol, or PM, is our first gun. A typical low-level RPG weapon, it's absolutely miserable to use. Fortunately, we won't be stuck with it for long. Welcome to the Zone of Alienation, the 60-kilometer wide area of exclusion that was set up around the Chernobyl NPP following the 1986 disaster. There are many things in the zone that can swiftly end your life. 
The hind gunships are an instantly recognizable symbol of Soviet military power. The area is supposed to be kept under lockdown by the military, but the prospects of lucrative treasure attracted many young men, adventurous opportunists, to jump fence and venture into the zone. Some of them operate in clans, factions with distinct ideologies and ethics. Others choose to adventure independently or in small groups. Stalkers who prefer this lifestyle are called loners. The loners, actually. In a certain sense, the loners are a legitimate faction of their own. The rookie village belongs to them. The man we're supposed to find, and possibly kill, Strelok, is one of those independent operators. He is the zone's legend, one of the greatest stalkers ever. Supposedly, he found a way into the center of the zone, where the mythical wish granter resides. While exploring, we hear a cry for help. I assist the wounded stalker, why not? You're okay, you know that? I'll be sure to tell everyone at the camp that you helped me out. The game tracks your reputation with various factions. The kind act will make the loners like us a little more. The cordon is the game's beginner area, and it has a little bit of everything. A few anomalies, a bunch of secrets to find, and places to explore. It introduces us to factional and political conflicts of the zone. Pipe down, man. Let me fill you in. Good guy stalkers were ambushed by bandits at the bridge in cordon. We need to kill the bandits and rescue the stalker they're holding prisoner. Men, Wolf here sent us some support along with the order to attack. Time to move on and be heroes. It's notable that the game doesn't actually have traditional player stats. No strength, agility, intelligence. Instead, the progression is achieved by getting better equipment and by learning gameplay tricks and techniques, ways of dealing with zone's hazards. The game feels like an RPG, even though it's a philosophical question if it is one. We assault the bandit camp. The starter weapons are very unsatisfying to use. The original Deus Ex also had this problem, but in that game the weapon performance was tied to your character's skills. There are no skills in Stalker. Makarov is just bad and other guns we'll get in Cordon are not much better. Thankfully, we are not alone in this firefight. Other loners join in. Contrary to their self-description, the loners are almost never alone. We rescue the hostage. Op success. I owe you, brother. I could never thank you enough. Hostile humans are only one of the zone's many threats. These are the anomalies, the mysterious energy phenomenon. In many instances, they are invisible to the naked eye. This is what the bolts are for. We have an unlimited supply of those. Throwing bolts is a cheap but reliable method of anomaly detection. Reminds me of the old urban legend, how, supposedly, NASA spent millions developing a pen that would function in space, whereas the Soviet cosmonauts used a pencil. The simplicity and thrift. But it's just a legend. Turns out a pencil is actually terrible for writing in space. In reality, both the Americans and the Soviets used space pens. In fact, even at the height of the Cold War, they both used the same pen manufactured by the same company in Nevada. I'm not sure where I'm going with this. I do like the bolt mechanic. Perhaps Stalker 2 would allow us to repurpose random items and objects in the game world as tools for exploration. <laughs> This is a boar, a common mutant, yet very dangerous in the early stages of the game. The mutated dogs are another common threat. The dogs are blind. Rapid mutations led to the loss of sight, which was compensated with an extraordinary development of the sense of smell. The animals have an ability to instinctively identify and avoid anomalies, radiation, and other invisible dangers of the zone. They hunt in packs. Individually weak, swarms of them present a danger even to experienced stalkers. The latter is also somewhat true in real life. The biggest threat to real-life stalkers who explore the actually existing zone of alienation outside Kiev is not radiation or mutants, it's dogs and cops. Looks like the bandit base we cleared is now occupied by loners. The northern half of Cordon is blocked by a military checkpoint. The soldiers don't open fire right away. Instead, they attempt to extort money from us. I suggest you take off before we get angry. There are several ways of dealing with the situation. There is an option of simply paying them off. Then it's possible to kill Kuznetsov and his goons. But that's gonna be pretty hard at this point, since our weapons are pea shooters, while they are armed with 
with assault rifles. Low-tier assault rifles, but still, these are nevertheless superior to the Makarov or our sawed-off shotgun. It's possible to sidestep the checkpoint entirely by traversing this anomaly-infested tunnel. I hope you're good at using the bolts. The easiest way of avoiding the soldiers is by climbing this hill. And if you're good at FPS acrobatics, you can even get two stalker stashes hidden in the abandoned train cars. Time to go back to Sidorovich. Got anything valuable? Well, that depends on how you define valuable. We sell various cheap guns we picked from dead bandits. The trader doesn't pay much for those. Sidorovich informs us that he and other traders are trying to find means of opening the way to the north, towards the power plant, which is currently blocked by something called the Brain Scorcher, a mysterious device deep in the zone that emits psi waves powerful enough to cause brain damage to anyone who comes too close. The first step of getting rid of the Scorcher involves stealing classified documents from a military base not far from the Agroprom Research Institute. Following the Chernobyl disaster, the Soviet government created Agroprom to analyze the possibilities of agriculture on irradiated soil. Getting to the institute is our next step. Good hunting, stalker. I suppose this is a good time to talk about the incident itself. This story actually begins on Saturday 26, April 1986. There has been a nuclear accident in the Soviet Union and the Soviets have admitted that it happened. The Soviet version is this. One of the atomic reactors at the Chernobyl atomic power plant near the city of Kiev was damaged and there is speculation in Moscow that people were injured and may have died. Almost 50,000 people had to be evacuated from the immediate area, primarily from the nearby city of Pripyat. The disaster happened in shockingly close distance to Ukrainian capital of Kiev, or Kiev. Several ways of spelling that name. The first variant is the Russian spelling, and the second is Ukrainian. Depending on who you are talking to, picking your own option might get you in trouble. Orthography is serious shit. Many people have spilled blood for the right to use their version of the name. <sighs> God damn, you know what? I think we're getting ahead of ourselves again. We need to go even further back into the past. Okay, so this story really, really begins in the year 753, the early Middle Ages. There is this cool science trick called dendrochronology, the scientific method of dating tree rings to the exact year they were formed. This is how we know that in the year 753, the town of Staraya Ladoga was founded by Scandinavians in what is now northern Russia. The settlement becomes a prosperous trading outpost for jewelry, craft tools and dress adornments. A multi-ethnic town, Staraya Ladoga was dominated by Vikings, who were called Rus. The Rus loved two things, money and murder, and they were phenomenally good at both of those. Until the second half of the 10th century, Ladoga was one of the most important trading ports of Eastern Europe. Merchant vessels sailed from the Baltic Sea through here to Novgorod, and then to Constantinople or the Caspian Sea. The ancestors of Rus Vikings reigned in the medieval Slavic state called Kiev on Rus, with its most important city being Kiev. Fast forward more than a thousand years into the future. A bunch of stuff happened. The Mongol invasion. Peter's empire. Ukraine was incorporated into Russia. There were two world wars. This guy got launched into space. Tetris was invented. In an attempt to keep their empire stable and diffuse local nationalism, the Soviets were actively cultivating a new common identity. Now, in Central Asia, this approach would prove to be unsuccessful. Tribalism would prevail. But in the Eastern Slavic lands, the plan worked, and the Soviet man managed to outlast the USSR itself. Stalker is sometimes mistakenly referred to as Russian Fallout. This is obviously false, since its origins are firmly Ukrainian, but it was an easy mistake to make. The Soviets had their own sophisticated sci-fi tradition called Fantastica. 
It's best personified by Strugatsky brothers. One of their most known works is a 1971 novel, Roadside Picnic. In the story, mysterious aliens visited Earth, landing in so-called visitation zones. The aliens didn't really pay any attention to human inhabitants at all, and eventually they just took off and went elsewhere, leaving behind a bunch of extraterrestrial garbage. The alien invasion was a roadside picnic of sorts on their way to their actual real destination. It's like a depressive Soviet anti-Star Trek. In the book, a stalker is a rogue, an explorer who breaks into forbidden visitation zones and steals various technological artifacts. And there was also a stalker movie. The 1979 film by Soviet director Andrei Tarkovsky is a slow-moving and melancholic picture very loosely based on the book. In the movie, a stalker leads two of his clients, a writer and a scientist, through the wilderness into the heart of the zone, where supposedly there is a chamber that grants person's innermost desires, a wish granter. Many of these narrative elements would later find their way to the GSC video game. In the southernmost part of the cordon, there is a military outpost. The soldiers there have high-quality medical supplies, but getting to them will be a challenge. The Ukrainian military tends to shoot stalkers on sight. The outpost itself is a completely optional location, but I want the loot, and this is a good way of showing stalkers' artificial intelligence system, or a life, like it's called. The zone is inhabited by hundreds of characters, none of them are scripted. The NPCs and even monsters have a full life cycle. They migrate, accomplish tasks, engage in combat, eat and rest. A life is similar to Bethesda's Radiant AI, except it actually works. I ran across a couple of mud crabs not long ago. The system is great at creating spontaneous action. The soldiers chased me all the way back to the starting camp where Sidorovich resides. Inadvertently, I provoked a war between the Free Stalkers and the Ukrainian military. It's too late to back out of the fight now. Numbers-wise, we're about even, but the soldiers are equipped with AKs and body armor. The Stalkers are armed with Makarovs. I'm gonna have to do a miracle. The loud noises attract the attention of a nearby pack of mutated dogs. Now I have a machine gun. The first assault rifle we got in Stalker, the AKM-74U, is a smaller variant of its big relative, the AKM-74. Regardless of its shortcomings, it's very useful as player's first full-auto weapon. The caliber allows us to punch through light and medium-armored enemies. This thing shreds bandits to pieces. The fighting goes on with many casualties on both sides. The Stalker AI works really well on a tactical level. Human enemies yell out obscenities, communicate with one another, and may even attempt to sneak up on you. Like in this sequence, one of the soldiers flanked the camp all the way back from where the entrance to Sidorovich store is. <sighs> Dead bodies everywhere. The military assault is repelled, but at a cost. One hell of a night. I loot the corpses and sell excess Makarovs to Sid. Stalker has a day and night cycle, but in the shadow of Chernobyl there is no way to manually fast forward time. You can't sleep in the game. During the night hours it's hard to see anything and you just have to wait it out. I purchased a new gun, a Viper 5. The weapon is a Stalker version of HK MP5A3. All guns in Stalker, well, almost all guns in Stalker have real-life counterparts. Most of them are renamed for legal reasons. Since the military expanded their manpower in a fruitless attack on the loner's camp, nobody is defending the base anymore. Well, nobody except for this guy. We loot the outpost. They have all kinds of good stuff. Ammo, medkits, anti-radiation supplies. Not sure what's up with the loudspeaker. I guess it's an automated message. This is not much of a military outpost, really. Barracks, a guard tower, a bunch of rusty vehicles that don't look functional. They bring radioactive, unidentified items from the zone that are highly dangerous. 
he is right, you know, and this is actually true in real life as well. In one shape or another, stalkerism was a thing since the creation of the Zone in 1986. But only in 2007, after the release of Stalker the video game, real life incursions into the forbidden territory became a full-fledged youth subculture. The developers didn't expect that to happen, but for Ukrainian millennials who grew up in the 90s, there wasn't a whole lot in life to look forward to. They curry in the forbidden, recover meaning from Soviet detritus, and take digital appropriation to new extremes, says the 2014 Slate article on the phenomenon, using very poetic language. The security service of Ukraine is calling all right-minded and loyal citizens to collaborate with the authorities. Speaking of criminal acts, both in real life and certainly in-game, there is a very real shady side to stalkerism. Here is me assassinating a neutral stalker in order to complete a randomly generated A-Life mission. Sidorovich said he was a bad guy, but it's not like we have a real court of law here or anything. Stalkers are not exactly angels. We save another fellow loner from a pack of blind dogs. We're done with those mutants. The appeal of stalker lifestyle is obvious. In the fictional setting of the game, there are riches, artifacts waiting for you in the zone. And if you are skilled enough, and lucky enough, to reach the mythical center of the zone, like Strelok did, supposedly your wish will be granted. It's a post-apocalyptic romance, says one of real-life stalkers to a journalist from Slate. The loudspeaker is impotently yelling in the distance. Some loner is playing a guitar. A sound of wind blowing. You can fall in love. Many people do. So you're back. Sid likes our acquisitions from the military base. But before we leave the cordon, we need to tie up some loose ends. What are you standing there for, stalker? If you want to go through, come up and we... The military checkpoint is a hard fight in this stage of the game. It feels like an exam for everything we've learned so far. But we do get a unique Ford 12 pistol as a replacement for our Makarov. The weapon is of a post-Soviet design. It was created in the early 90s by a Ukrainian company from Vinitsa. It's an upgrade, but not a major one. The northern exit from the cordon is blocked by yet another smallish military outpost. This one was abandoned a long time ago and is now occupied by bandits. We make short work of them, but this is a sign of things to come. It's the bandits! Help! <laughs> Buzz off, stalker. We don't let every loser go through. In the conversation about art, there is this idea called auteur theory. Art is often very complicated, collaborative art especially so. A typical modern film production involves around 600 people. More sophisticated motion pictures often involve the work of thousands. But nevertheless, a movie is still a work of art because a filmmaker, a director, functions like an author of a novel bringing all those pieces together under a creative vision. Auteur theory is sometimes used to attack video games games as an art form. Just like movies, video games can be way too complex, involving labor of dozens, sometimes hundreds of people. Red Dead Redemption 2 had 1600 developers. Who is the director of that game? Is it this guy? But if you know your video games, you understand how silly these insinuations are. For one, yes, a video game director is an actual job. And without a doubt, there are many video game auteurs with a distinct voice. Hideo Kojima, Tim Schafer, Hidetaka Miyazaki, Tim Kane, Josh Sawyer. I survived because the fire inside burned brighter than the fire around me. Not to mention there are games, usually indie games, made by small teams or even single individuals. Still, we must acknowledge that there is something to the whole auteur argument. After all, enjoying a committee-designed battlefield game doesn't really feel like you're enjoying art. The philosophical conversation about the purpose and definition of art was started by Plato at around 400 BC, and as of March 2021, the debate is still ongoing, with no conclusion in sight. But whatever it is that makes art valuable, whatever it is that makes art art, 
I'm sure we can all agree that while this quality might be present in Team Schafer's Grim Fandango, it's definitely lacking in generic Ubisoft or Activision games. And honestly, there is a completely different way of looking at things. One can say that the reason why this art form is good is exactly because it's so complex and disjointed. Video game developers are human, just like the rest of us, and their perspectives are informed by culture they are marinated in. The developers bring these perspectives, intentionally or not, into the creative works they make. Not unlike movies, video games are time capsules. The cover art of the legendary 1993 first-person shooter Doom resembles a heavy metal album. The game emanates the teenage angst of Generation X. 1993 was a long time ago. Gen Xers are older people now. But yet here it is, their childhood captured, saved and preserved for all of us to enjoy. The original Deus Ex puts us in the world of 80s conspiracy theories, black helicopters, one world government, the Illuminati. All of this seems so quaint now. The conspiracy culture kept evolving. Video games are here to preserve these old points of view for us. And not unlike archaeologists, we excavate them, examine them, enjoy them, learn from them, or laugh at how goddamn stupid they are. Or, you know, a combination of these things. And when it comes to this sort of video game archaeology, the Ukrainian stalker is the lost city of Troy. Oh, and in case you were wondering why stalker is spelled with periods between letters, does it stand for anything? Um, no. Not really. It exists because after their Warcraft 2000 adventure, the developers were getting real paranoid about copyright. 